uh, welcome back everyone after that short break. Uh, the next session now we will look at, look at uh, public participation in practice. But I'd like to draw your attention to the poll. The poll has been launched, so we would love you to uh, just respond to that. Either it will be open now throughout the, the full uh, second session. So you have up until uh, the end of the second session to complete the poll. But please uh, have a look at that and put in your response. We'll, we'll give the response in the conclusion uh, statement, uh, in the final closing statement. So um, I'll carry on. Uh, it'll be the same as before. All the present, uh, presenters will make their presentations and we'll ask you to put in questions into the uh, question and answer box and we'll uh, have our discussion then at the end of all the presentations. So our first speaker this afternoon is Mark Horton and Mark Horton is All Ireland Director overseeing the growth and development of Rivers Trusts in Ireland. He is also the Chief Executive of Ballandary Rivers Trusts and has many years of experience working with communities to develop and uh, deliver community visions and actions for their local catchments. Patrick's um, or Mark's uh, title for his presentation is The Learnings from Ballanderry and Oriel Rivers and Catchment uh, Association. Uh, yeah, so learnings from those. Thanks, Mark. Uh, okay, uh, Greta, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the Water Forum for this invitation to speak today. Uh, so um, just to explain, uh, as Greta said, I'm the All Island Director of the Rivers Trust. The Rivers Trust is the umbrella body uh, for the Rivers Trust movement uh, in both the UK and Ireland. Uh, and we work with all of our member trusts across these islands uh, to support the work that they're doing in their own individual catchments. And our vision uh, for the future of, uh, I'm just trying to get my slides to move on here. There we go. Uh, our vision for the future of all rivers across Ireland and the UK is to have wild, healthy and natural rivers that are valued by all. And it's fair to say that the growth of the rivers trusts across the island of Ireland has been massive over the last kind of five or six years. You can see there the map of the rivers trusts um, with a growing number. Uh, in fact, there are two new rivers trusts or a river association uh, forming uh, as we speak. Uh, but I'm going to focus uh, mainly uh, in this short presentation on uh, Ballander Rivers Trust in Northern Ireland and the Oriel River Catchments and Coastal Association uh, in Louth, uh, which is a cross-border organisation, both of which have participated in uh, visioning exercises for their catchment. So we have to go back a little bit in time uh, to when the first cycle of Water Framework Directive was being talked about in Northern Ireland. So we talking back around 2005, 2006. Uh, and uh, Ballander Rivers Trust had already got a long track record of working in the community to undertake projects to help them make small and improve the Ballander River. Um, but we were very focused on this particular uh, couple of sentences in, in the Water Framework Directive, which was that the success of this new directive at the time would rely on cooperation uh, between the member states, um, but also between uh, local communities and consultation and the involvement of the public at a local level. And at that time, uh, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency were um, developing uh, local management plans for each of the uh, river catchments in Northern Ireland uh, and holding uh, consultation events to get people's input into what should be in those plans but our observation was the people who were attending these events were largely government stakeholders. They were maybe representatives of non-government organisations and charities and lobby groups, but they weren't the people who lived and worked in those catchments. They were not the landowners, the educators, the anglers, the canoeists, but they were people who were supposedly representing them and their views. So really were they capturing the voices of the local people on the ground? So at that time, Ballandale Rivers Trust um, partnered with WWF, the Global Conservation Organization. And we asked that question, that, you know, there needs to be more community involvement in river basin planning. And we decided to build a new uh, public participation method around uh, this simple model known as the participation continuum. Uh, and it basically sets out that there's a journey that you go on through participation, uh, starting with information sharing, which can be websites and fact sheets. And this is about informing people on what's going on and what's happening in their local area. 
You then move to consultation, which is surveys, having focus groups uh, and meetings that people can attend to express their opinions. Uh, and hopefully they're captured to be taken on board. So this is about listening to people's views. But moving through the continuum, you should really start to look at collaboration. And this is what we've been talking about this morning, about workshops to engage people in the conversation about what can happen and how they can work together to achieve that and involve people in the problem solving element of what needs to be done in the local area. And then finally, empowering that community to take ownership of all of those issues at a catchment scale and also um, provide them with the resources that they need in order to act and make a difference on the ground so they become involved in the joint decision making and defining the roles that they want to play within catchment management. And on the basis of this model, we devised the Ripple project and what became known as the Ripple process. So the Ripple project was to encourage local people in the Ballandary catchment to reconnect with their river and to act as a community to protect it but also to act as a demonstration to government and decision makers that there was a different way of uh, pursuing um, collaboration and involvement in, in catchment management. And so we held a series of meetings across the Ballandary River system and we uh, took what was traditionally a community planning process and adapted it for integrated catchment management. And we did this in partnership with the Rural Community Network. And in fact, um, in earlier in the presentations, we heard about how we need to redress the balance between environmental scientists, catchment scientists, community practitioners and scientists and so on. This project really did uh, create a level footing between the social scientists and the environmental scientists to try and come up with a new process. And it was all about getting people to think about their sense of place and space. So where did they live in the catchment in, and work in the catchment in relation to where the river was and how they used the river. Uh, also, we used a tool called Appreciative Inquiry, where we explored people's memories of the river uh, and the history of the river. And this helped people to ground their thinking in what their future vision might be for the catchment. And we then went through a visioning process. And it was really great to see the examples that Alexandra was giving around doodling, because it's very much what we were doing getting people to stick down pictures and images and come up with their vision for the future of the Ballandary. And then importantly, asking people to consider what needed to be done to make that vision a reality, who needed to be involved and what their role was. And over 300 people took part in that process. And by exploring the memories, creating the vision and exploring who needed to do what and what role they would play, we ended up creating a baseline the aims, the actions, the partners and the drivers of what became known as the Ballandary River Management Plan. And the visions of the community at that time were wanting better access to the river, a better understanding of the river environment, a cleaner river and more wildlife. And 115 actions sat behind those visions, each one of them adopted by a member of the community called a Ripple Champion. And this is a good example of where top down meets bottom up in terms of impairing communities at attachment scale. So the community's visions of a cleaner river and more wildlife very much contribute to good ecological status for Water Framework Directive. But better access and a better understanding don't feature as highly in our catchment management planning, particularly at a government level, but at a community level, they're highly valued and they're there to help people have, uh, be able to protect their rivers better and have a better understanding of what's going on. And in essence, what we ended up with was a community plan that became integrated with the government's catchment plan. So a partnership was created between the government and the local community that resulted in the updating of the local management plan that eventually fed into the European plan for water uh, management uh, at a catchment scale in the Ballandary. So if we go back to our um, uh, public participation continuum, uh, Ripple certainly inf uh, shared information and increased the knowledge of the public about the importance of their local river, but also went through the steps of listening to people's views, getting people involved in the problem solving, and more importantly, in empowered them to actually take action uh, to uh, make the decisions and enact the plan itself uh, to bring about positive change for the Ballandary catchment. So it really is a true example of and deliberative democracy. This same method was then repeated in the Dundalk Bay area in partnership with Lo uh, the Law Pro and also uh, Dundalk uh, Institute of Technology, 
Greta at that time was the community water officer. Uh, and we held a series of meetings across the catchment. We had a lot of participation. Uh, 117 people took part from various backgrounds. And they again came up with their visions for what they wanted to see happen in the Dundalk Bay area. But overarching all of these visions was the ambition to create some kind of umbrella body or charity that could oversee the delivery of the vision uh, and the action plan. And so what we have now got today is a wonderful organisation called ORCA uh, that formed in 2020 to take over what was a fledgling Dundalk Bay Rivers Association. It's now registered as a company and is registering as a charity and working very closely with Law Pro for, through the Community Water Fund. And they're planning all sorts of projects now on the back of that visioning process that was true public participation in what people wanted to see happen uh, in their particular catchment. So in summary and briefly, we know that a uh, visioning exercise can create common agreement on what the community want to see happen and also a way forward that can be prioritised by the community. And certainly the visioning process strengthens the community uh, groups that exist within an area because it provides them with a focus and a strategic plan on which to base their partnerships to deliver action. It also helps to support, uh, to, to um, secure statutory support for those community actions, especially where the goals overlap between statutory plans and the local community's aspirations. And the strategic plan that's developed can also be used to attract funding. Uh, and since 2010, as an example, Ballander Rivers Trust has drawn down around 1.2 million sterling to deliver projects across the Ballander for the wider public benefit on the back of that plan. But these are important points I want to highlight quickly. Uh, the community catchment planning exercise I've outlined demonstrates that you can do community engagement affordably. It can be accessible and it can be repeatable. But you do need people there to support and facilitate that process. And the Ripple method is a good example of where that's been tried and tested, both with an established group and one that is establishing. Uh, true participation is absolutely key to meaningful integrated catchment management and getting those actions delivered on the ground and empowering the local community to take action and change behavior and make real environmental improvement is 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 the outcome of a good community participatory process but i want to highlight and underline this last point that local groups need need to be properly resourced if they're going to take part in these public participation exercises and be expected to play a role later on uh, in delivering catchment activities. Um, we're seeing at the moment groups struggling because they do not have the resources to cover their basic core costs that would allow them to even go out and do a litter pick or, or a training exercise. So there needs to be uh, a serious discussion at government level with community associations about how these actions are going to be funded in the future and how these groups are going to be made sustainable. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mark. That was uh, very interesting. Some great work being done and some good recommendations for going forward. Our next speaker is uh, Michal Kaneda, and uh, he brings a range of experience uh, in the public, private and voluntary sectors with a special interest in, and he has a special interest in policy and advocacy for the environment and sustainable development. Michal spent 10 years as director of the EPA and a decade as head of the Marine Environment Team at the Marine Institute in Galway. Amongst his recent projects has been to review Law Pro in 2020 with Greg Bullock and a review of the National Parks and Wildlife Service in 2021 with Professor Jane Stout. Since returning to Galway, he has uh, formed, been a co-founder of Corrib Bio Partnership, which promotes the sustainable development of the Corrib catchment. Michal has a DBA from Waterford Institute on the theme of social learning and water management, the case of the Water Framework Directive in Europe. Michal is presenting today on the roles of catchment communities in protecting water, nature and heritage. Thank you, Michal. Good morning, folks. I guess I'm going to I'm delighted to be here. So this talk is really building on the three kinds of experiences that I would have had that Greta talked about there, working in state agencies, some research work, and also then the more recent experience working with Carabio in Galway. 
And the subtitle of this talk, you might wonder, what is it about six characters in search of an author? It's a play by Pirandello that was first staged 100 years ago this month. And it's about this idea of people looking for the script or unfinished business. We'll come back to that later on. So to move on and see if I can move this slide on. It's stuck briefly. Yes. So a summary of the talk, catchment groups and specifically Cara Bill, a little bit about the iCatch network, and then three challenges that we have come across, echoing what Mark and others have said already, and some recommendations to address those challenges. So the good news, first of all, is there's lots of positives in terms of community organizations getting involved with the environment. More than 220 have started in the last 20 years. Water policy, in principle, is broadly supportive in Ireland. LawPro has been a great step up uh, since it started in 2016, encouraging active public participation in river basin management. As we've just heard from Mark, 15 plus river trusts have been set up. And now we have this network, ICATCH, which is a network of catchment groups. So there are a lot of positives in this area. And then particularly the case of Corrado, which I was involved in starting in 2018 with support from LawPro. Our idea is building a network of communities around the lake. And Loch Corrib in that picture is the second largest lake system in Ireland. And it's a broad, or we call it holistic view. We're talking about heritage work, heritage visits to Inchigil Island. Education work, we work closely with the group called Echo Ed for All, a lot of the same directors. Trails projects around the lake, submissions on river basin plans, a couple of projects with Rivers Trust and others for a Corrib forum and a Corrib data portal joint meetings about water quality with our colleagues, the Waterways Foundation and Galway City and others. But like lots of other groups, our activities have been curtailed since spring 2020. I think the main thing that we're learning is this idea of building communities of practice. So this is a picture of people working on the Trails Project. And the idea of community of practice, some of you would be familiar with it. It's a guy called Wenger came up with it. A group of people who come together to build and share knowledge or share skills and to build networks who care about the same real life topic or problems and interact regularly. So we are building that in the Carib, and I think all of the other catchment groups around the country are really building and can then apply those community practices to water, to nature, and indeed to climate as we heard earlier on. An important step in the last couple of years has been the development of this network called iCatch. It was identified first of all, uh, as an idea at a meeting that Mark and colleagues from Rivers Trust co-hosted in November 2019 in Athlone. And a lot of the training needs that you see there were identified at that meeting. Catchment organisations, how to apply for funding, governance, project management, campaigning and so on. So following from that, an application went in and has been funded for this group called iCatch, which is staffed just one person part-time, Liz Gabbett. And you can see there, there's 13 member organisations nearly all the Rivers Trusts, Carabio and some more. And it has been, I think, an important part of building a community of practice. So two things are happening. First of all, formal training or skills training on engaging communities, finance, governance, conflict resolution, river processes. And you see the names of the people all really expert people there and project management this month. But the informal social learning is equally important. People are getting to know each other across these groups around Ireland. And I think that's the really valuable part. So it looks pretty good. The policy landscape, you can see these are quotes from the new draft river basin management plan for the next five years, which is still out for consultation. And I just pick up uh, a couple of key quotes. Page 56, very interesting sentence. A number of groups are already engaged. We would like to continue to nurture and grow this active engagement. So when Colin Byrne and his colleagues in the Customs House write that, it means we're doing okay, but we would like to see more. So the question arises, how will we going to nurture and grow this active engagement? There's a very important uh, phrase there, an action for LawPro to develop templates for the 46 catchments and to examine ways in which support can be provided. So I think that we need to look then, how does this policy translate into practice? Our experience in Corrado, and we've heard it from others as well today, is that real gaps and challenges remain. And I identified three parts of that, on governance, on funding, and then a science and data model. 
So to look at each of those in turn very briefly. On the governance model, Alec Ralston and Suzanne Lenan, who's co-hosting today's session, wrote a paper, a really good paper in 2016, and they identified as the number one risk, the lack of community engagement framework in water. Patrick Bresnan in 2019 talked about inequity in power and resources, which need to be remedied. And he has talked about that again this morning. And then we've heard that these six, 46 catchment plans are there, but there isn't a model yet for how we engage. And my own summing up of it is that while the plans signal a greater role for non-state actors, such as community groups, I don't think the rules of the game have yet adapted to provide these actors. So it's gone back to Pirandello, characters in search of an author, a script, unfinished business. On the funding model, I echo what Mark Horton has just said. LAWPRO is great. We're delighted with the progress. The funding is very good, but it isn't enough. You can see there the level in 2021. This year, it'll be 320,000. But the requests are for close to 2 million. And staff and overhead costs are not eligible. And there is an issue with match funding. So to be honest with you, we are struggling with this area of match funding, project funding, and no staff overheads. That model needs to be addressed. And the science and the data side, there's great data being collected by the EPA teams and by the law pro catchment teams. But de facto, a lot of that really rich data is limited to public agencies, is not publicly available. Again, Law Pro have a fantastic booklet, 100 pages, an overview of catchment science and really good training for local authority staff, which is welcome. But there isn't an equivalent model of that as such for catchment groups at this stage. And what we are really being directed towards is citizen science projects. And Fran will talk about that in a few minutes. They're great, but... It goes back to this idea that Claude Harris talked about earlier on. What is the purpose? Where are we going? And I don't think that we have evolved fully the science and the data model to involve community groups. So three recommendations. And these are practical recommendations. We've heard a lot this morning about the theory of public participation. I'm putting these forward as practical recommendations that we need to tackle this year before the third river basin management plan is finalised. And these are quotes from a report that I published, which are a case study on Inishowen and on Moy for the IPA last year. First of all, a new and more inclusive engagement with catching groups is essential for the Third River Basin Management Plan. And there is a task, as I said earlier, for LAWPRO to develop a template. And I'm asking that LAWPRO work with Forum Ishka, with the iCatch Network, with the SWAN Network, to develop those templates this year before the end of the year. And the law pro funding, it should be scaled up. IFI have a 1 million euro fund, and that's great. And the new catchment, sorry, climate action fund, 5 million euro for Pubble, fantastic. But the scale of what we have from law pro needs to be at least a million euro plus and provide for core funding for catchment groups in order to enable those groups to do the work that Greta or others are talking about in regard to film and so on. And finally, a roadmap for sharing knowledge and water data needs to be worked out. And I think that work on all those three need to happen at the same time. Strengthen the governance, strengthen the funding, strengthen the data science. And just in summary, the state is 100 years old this month. I echo all of what Patrick Bresnan has said earlier on. I think we need to move ahead. We need to take a leaf from the work that's been done on uh, participative democracy in other countries. And we need to really start to engage citizens fully and the catchment groups. We're willing to do it. And I just want to thank our partners here from Carabio, Inishowen, like Trish Murphy, Liz Gabbett and iCatch, Mark and Constanz in the Rivers Trust, Law Pro Crew, the catchments team, Fora Mishka. A lot of really great expertise and enthusiasm there, but we're not going to achieve the full potential of these catchment groups unless we address the questions around governance, funding, and a data model. So look forward to your thoughts on that, folks. Gramil Mahagav, thank you. Um, thank you, Michal. That was a very, very helpful and informative presentation. Um, I'm sure it will be discussed further later. Uh, please uh, put your questions in the question box. Um, we are going to have a contribution now from Sean Corrigan from the National Federation of Group Water Schemes. He seconded to them from Irish Water. Um, Sean has worked with communities on water-related projects for over 15 years. 
He is currently on, um, sorry, Sean, was the program lead on the implementation of the national uh, uh, group water schemes groundwater source protection pilot program in Roscommon. He has an engineering background and is a voluntary sustainability director with the children's charity Variety Ireland and a trainee beekeeper. Sean's presentation today is going to be on using biodiversity to engage communities on catchment actions. Thank you, Sean. Now, my apologies, can you hear me there? Slides have jumped on a little bit, my apologies. Okay, thanks very much for having me on and it was great to listen to everybody else and the massive interest that's that's here today um, and what everyone is trying to achieve. A little bit about the project, I'm gonna give you a bit of a case study on a project the National Federation group of Group Water Schemes are working on across County Roscommon. Uh, these projects are working across the country, but the, for the focus of this presentation, it'll be just on Roscommon. And um, the catchments that you can see here, cover an area of roughly 200 square kilometers. I suppose when I came over to join the Federation from Irish Water, my own role was to actually implement the source protection measures that have been identified in the source protection plans that have been developed over a number of years. As you can see from the diagram there on the right hand side, like, you know, we're all aware of it, that agriculture is probably the biggest, well, is the biggest, um, I suppose, area of concern for ourselves in the group water scheme sector but there are others as well and the farmers that we've spoken to across the areas within the catchment knew that as well the majorities of measures that we developed are nature-based solutions and they have multiple benefits and we developed a handbook of source protection measures for the farmers as well and i think the handbook is, is a great tool for ourselves and a great tool for anybody if they want to have a look at it it's it, they'll find it on our website um, and the measure, when we approach farmers ourselves, we don't go in with a, a plan directly for each particular farm. We speak to the farmers themselves. And I think one of the one of the items that Patrick had mentioned earlier on about the inequity of power with our with our stakeholders as well, it's really important that when we do engage with the farming community, that we don't just go in with a with a stick. We go in there with a I suppose a book of measures that, that we can introduce. On Forum Ishka in 2020, published this document here in this diagram that everything that we have in our catchment is linked. The air, the ecosystems, the, war, the, the, the water and the soil. So the measures that we have introduced, look at everything that's, that's within the catchment. In, 19, in 2019, the National Biodiversity Centre had a survey and 88% of Irish people believe that the government are not doing enough to protect our bees. So we thought we'd take this concept and bring it into our, in, into our implementation of the catchment management plans. So we wanted to use bees as the driver. So we worked with the farming community and we had two strands. Of, we had two strands. There was engagement where we listened to and raised awareness and removed the barriers to educate the farming community. And we also had direct actions. I suppose you can see some of our measures there. We had information that was sent out to the farming community that was sent out through the Roscommon Herald. I think there was about 20,000 copies went out across the full county. We also have one of our managers there, the group water scheme managers, uh, Thomas Rush. He actually spoke with a mental health services unit in Castlery. And again, we wanted to get more people involved. And the mental health services unit, they actually manufactured, or they're in the process of manufacturing I think 500 B hotels that will go out to a number of households across the Curra Creek Group Water Scheme to raise awareness on the damage that pesticides can do. And again, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to inv involve the most vulnerable people in our society as well. So we're not just dealing with the bigger stakeholders, the NGOs, the local authorities, we're actually involving everyone within the community as well, from the mental health services units to the schools, to the elderly, to the most vulnerable people. We wanted everyone to take part in what we were trying to achieve. So we developed an initiative called I've planted a tree and my garden is pesticide free. And it was a very simple ask. We wanted children across the county to bring home the message that everybody in the community could do something. 
So we sent out 8,500 trees to 88 out of the 91 national schools within the county and information on how people could go pesticide-free in their own communities and in, in, in their own gardens. And it was very, very successful. And it's a very simple message as well. Like, you know, people are doing something, the children are doing something, they're taking part, they're planting a tree and they're going pesticide-free. We sent out a survey along with that um, information pack and we had over a thousand respondents and we thought that was a very high figure. So we had, you know, we, we did manage to capture the imagination of people within the community. So 69% of people who answered our survey were using pesticides. That's a lot of people. You know, pesticides are a big issue for water, for water within catchments themselves. So we found that over two thirds of people were using pesticides. But one of, the most interesting, one of the most interesting facts that we found was that for people to stop protecting the bees were more important than protecting people's natural health or protecting the water. So the message of using biodiversity as a driver to help change catchment's attitudes has been borne out. One of our family, farming families here, the Nallies, you can see on the left-hand side of the picture, the green field that we went into, first of all, with one of our managers, we had issues there with uh, runoff, uh, high, high phosphorus, um, E. coli. David Nally and his family put in a riparian buffer zone there, you can see it in the middle. And we reward them with a plaque to say that they've taken part in the project. Another one of our families here, the Durrs, when we first approached the Durrs, they had an area cleared with, that had been cleared with pesticides um, for their beehives. They thought it'd be nice to have a nice clean area. So, you know, there was a, there was a lack of knowledge there as well. So the, the other photograph was taken about a year later. They sowed some wildflowers and that has become a talking point for people in their own community. You know, we know that wildflowers seeds are not probably ideal on a long-term basis, but this has created interest within the community itself. The project itself won the national, uh, won a European Bee Award. Um, there was about 30 entries across Europe uh, to, to change land use. This is, not everyone can get a beehive. Some of our other families here, their neighbors, what happened here in Corakri was that three farming families gave up in a total area of about two, two acres to protect sinking streams and they set up biodiversity gardens. One of the things that stands out about this image here is the happy faces of the people involved. None of these people here receive beehives, but they all put in riparian zones across their land. And you can see what it's meant to them to become involved in a project to help their local community. And that's what we have to do is to make sure that people can enjoy what they're doing. Again, it's not all about bees, biodiversity, settlement ponds here. Again, biodiversity was a driver for these people. They wanted to help their neighbors protect their bees, but it had the knock on effect of protecting their local water sources. I think this is my second last slide here, and it's a very important slide. I think a lot of the um, speakers today have mentioned that the fact that things take time. These are three farms in County Cavan, and in the first slide, there's a light green area. These are areas that the farmers have given to the local community to plant forestry. The middle slide, there's some dark green areas. Again, these have been given to plant forestry as well. And in the third slide, there's a red border, an area again, which has been given to plant forestry. None of these farmers initially had, had wanted to put forestry in place, but because of the trust that we had developed with them by visiting them, visiting them on numerous occasions, they wanted to do something to help their community. I suppose to finish up, trust, honesty, and mutual respect are key to what we're trying to achieve. And one thing I have to say is the group water scheme sector, in the areas where farmers have given above and beyond land that they have to give for re environmental regulations, the group water scheme sector have encouraged their, their members or their boards to compensate the farmers in those particular areas as well. So what we're seeing is, is group water schemes, which are owned by communities, ran by communities and managed by communities, they've recognized the importance of rewarding farmers for going above and beyond what they have to do. Thank you very much. All right, um, thank you very much, Sean. Some excellent work going on there. Our next speaker and our final speaker in this session is uh, Fran Igo. Dr. Fran Igo is 
uh, works as the Southern Regional Coordinator with the Local Authority Waters Programme, and he's been there since uh, 2016. He uh, works within the River Basin Management Plan and implementation structures, and he works with the agencies and communities to deliver water quality objectives. Prior to that, Fran uh, led catchment-based nature projects and river restoration programmes with Inland Fisheries Ireland. Um, thank you, Fran. Uh, thanks, Greta, and hello, everybody. Um, yes, I'm going to try and cover some of the learnings that we've made here in the Local Authority Waters Programme uh, during the second cycle in the context of, uh, I suppose, community engagement and participation. So I have a few slides I'll fly through Greta and then I'll try and slow down at the end for the actual learnings that we've, we've come across. So just waiting. I'm waiting for the slide to move. Okay, so language, I think this is key. This is a key discussion that we, ha we had from the beginning in Law Pro. We, we started back in 2016. Um, in terms of you know, what do we mean around about uh, when we talk about uh, participation, engagement, awareness raising, et cetera, et cetera. So when we talk about the, the engagement, when we come at it, we're, we're talking about trying to help people understand and get them you know, around the, the issues around water quality and the water from a directive and what we're, what we're trying to do with the River Basin Management Plan. And then in terms of participation, it's obviously more inv active involvement. And, and that's ideally where we want the whole process to go. Underpinning all of this is the water from a directive, as, as we all know, um, and water has a unique place within that directive, as you can see from the first line of the directive. And it does ask member states to actively involve people in that. And the EPA have a nice uh, piece on this on their catchments uh, newsletter, a guide for the water from a directive, where they talk about public participation and the importance of local communities getting involved in a meaningful way in the management and decision making process. So when Law Pro was, was set up, um, part of the function of Law Pro was to try and reach out and bring in that community element as well, because there was a recognition in the, from the first cycle of the River Basin Management Plan that that was not um, adequate. Um, our involvement is, we, you can see the governance structures there um, from the River Basin Management Plan. It's quite a busy space in terms of all the different committees and, and uh, at the different levels from national down to regional local. So we're down at the regional level there. Um, so in terms of... Uh, <clears throat> our focus with the public, we, we started off <clears throat> looking at awareness raising right through, as I said, engagement and participation and trying to support a uh, partnership working, ideally at a, a catchment focus. And we targeting A, the areas for action, which is which the work there is underpinned mostly by science, but also looking at the, the broader um, issues around protecting water quality as well. Um, so just both elements there. In terms of stakeholders, you know, we, we try to look at, you know, what are we talking about here, stake, stakeholder mapping, et cetera. So you can see there it's quite a, uh, quite a complex area. Stakeholders is basically everybody that lives in Ireland um, <clears throat> and at the different levels and groups and, and allegiances that they may have. Um, just taking the public, public participation network, um, you can see there the breakdown there just for Cork, quite complex. And there was a, a question asked this morning around the public participation. We've actually been working with the PPNs in the third cycle, we've already ran engagements across the country through, through the PPNs on the third cycle. So that, that, that process has started. We can see it's quite a busy space. In terms of the government agencies, we have other committees that re Greta referenced, the, these regional um, operational committees, and then they have different uh, levels uh, operating above that. So these, are, again, are very big committees of the 60 uh, people, people might attend on a quarterly basis, going through the various issues that, uh, that we're trying to resolve. Back to the, uh, the public side of things, when we started off, we, we, we realised very qu quickly that um, when we did our initial pilot on the River Shore, that awareness was quite low around water and, and how people connect with water uh, varied uh, depending on their perspective and where they're coming from. So we ran a number of festivals. We were linked up with the tidy towns and other, or other networks. And then we tried to push hard on the River Basin Management Plan and do a, 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 a deeper engagement that was done in the first cycle. So we would have ran engagements right through all the municipal districts so a lot of meetings, over 100, 120 meetings, and then um, a lot of engagements, again, at, in parallel at various events as well, encouraging people to make submissions. So the second um, plan um, does reflect this to some extent, and there's a number of um, um, areas there which um, fed into the plan, and that's, that, that, that is there for anybody to read in terms of what was, uh, um, what was taken on board. Um, and one example is the Community Water Development Fund, and that's the primary piece of engagement that we use now um, it's actually more important to us in terms of engaging people um, 
rather than let's say uh, physical works on the ground. But we try and, and encourage projects right across the scale. But it's it's you can see there from the map there. You know we we, are, we have a good geographic spread, and we, tr we try and keep that way. Working with the other networks and other programs, we've tried to reach out again. So we're conscious of this that you know we're not operating in a in a, in a vacuum. So with leader. Uh, done a lot of work there and in that one again we had to get involved with the uh, the, the leader companies uh, come up with guidance to, to try and support people and then uh, work with the department for rural community developments to actually change the rules around application of leader because uh, community access was poor and um, community conferences and other events run these again this is more about getting people involved uh, sharing ideas sharing experiences and so on and then we can then get a sense of, of what's happening out there what people's interests are Running in parallel with this, we do have a big outreach area and, and work with the agriculture sector as well. So I, I, I don't have time to go into that. Growing from the water sites, this was our COVID-19 event, uh, or sorry, um, early uh, COVID-19 participation piece to try and get uh, reach out to the public uh, online. And then we use that then to ascertain people's views as, as well as what's happening on the ground. Leader, again, back to leader, we're running a whole range of uh, uh, training uh, with the, the, the leader networks to try and, and improve water literacy and also encourage people to get involved in citizen science and then to actually develop projects. So bring it not just from awareness raising, but right through the actual actions and all that's localised on the ground. And we've done um, over half the networks now at this stage in 2021. So that's that, we're quite pleased with the way that's going. Uh, citizen science, this was developed very much through a participatory participa participatory process with all the, the relevant stakeholders. We've tried to be, to be as inclusive as possible to come up with schemes that would work for Ireland and then um, come up with a system. And that's going to um, uh, take off, hopefully, um, in a more, well, it will take off in, in, the, in, in, in the next cycle. Um, but look, in terms of the role of communities, I've just broken this down to operationally and then societally. Um, in the cycle cycle, you can see the list there. I don't think I'll read them all, Greta, but everything from river restoration right through to protection of drinking water sources, uh, which goes back to Sean's presentation there, and citizen science, et cetera. So uh, we've had a, a lot of uh, activities there. And then in terms of uh, wider society and influencing, I suppose this is where it's really important that we have that conversation and keep the conversation going, to make sure the water is important uh, in everybody's day-to-day -day activities. I think this is really cool. It's, it's not just about um, uh, plans and that we have to kind of ch change the conversation um, at the, at the, at the plant level. So, so what are the learnings? Um, so in terms of engagement, we know that people experience water in different ways. So very early on, we can see this, that some people are interested in water from a heritage point of view or from a navigation point of view or from a biodiversity point of view or from a drinking water point of view or a public health point of view. So we had to kind of um, bring that into our um, engagement pieces to make sure that we are actually speaking to people and target our messaging to the relevant audiences. Water literacy, um, quite low actually in a, in a lot of um, Irish society. That's just a reality. And uh, so this is an area that we've been working on that goes back to the leader training, for example, to try and help people understand how captions function. So, for example, we'd have people coming to our meetings um, in one hand saying there's not enough fish in the river and then at the same time looking to have the river dredged. So you have this kind of you know conflicting uh, understanding around uh, water, water management. Some sectors have more significant impact than others and impact on the viability potentially and quality of those sectors. This is an important uh, thing and it goes back to the equity discussion this morning. Uh, there's considerable interest at the same time in water quality and biodiversity by communities. We can see that. Um, and most of the interest operates at the local level. So not all uh, national issues are local, but all local issues are national. Um, when we actually uh, sounded out uh, the participants of the stories and water size, so these would not be our normal, um, let's say, river um, well aware um, 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 uh, groups. Uh, this is what we found that you know uh, over eighty percent of them are interested in 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 water quality efforts. Um, <clears throat> in terms of participation, we know it's very resource demanding. It requires a considerable awareness raising, animation, right through to problem solving and direct action. There's a huge variety of state bodies and sectors and that makes that uh, a confusing sp space, not just for the public participation, but also for the government sector in, in general. Um, water literacy does affect us and a sense of place, um, funding, you know, access to property, who wants what, etc. Expertise and guidance and obviously people's time as well. So that's a key factor that's coming through. Um, and um, that affects both at the project level uh, areas, but also uh, consultations, how, how much people can give time to and then the big, these challenges become bigger and we start thinking that the catchment scale. Again, when we asked uh, people uh, who uh, were involved in storage in the water side, this is what came back in terms of what they were interested in. Um, and you can see there, there's a big interest in local uh, community projects and what's happening at the local level, but also interest in the public consultations and citizen science. So it's important that we do respond to that. 
Now moving into the third cycle, you know, we know what the challenges are. The EPA has done massive work, and I think we need to acknowledge that that there's a huge amount of work on the scientific side. But obviously now this conversation about how do we actually blend all that with the public participation element. Um, what we're doing in the next cycle, we're going out, we're trying to uh, bring the information down to a more local level. So we are working at the county level in terms of mapping in that. When we go out and, and, and consult, we, we will be have we are um, starting our public meetings now. Um, which will be done at a kind of a combined municipal district level across the country. And so we're trying to frame the messaging, messaging so that it's more accessible in terms of what's actually happening on the ground in terms of the, the pressures, the sectors and the uh, and, and where the areas are at risk and in terms of you know what's wrong and where and try and localise it and make it more accessible for people. So I just finish up here, Greta. Um, how should community engagement and participation look like? I suppose, you know, this is, what your event is about, and, and uh, we certainly have welcomed this from Law Pro. Um, really, in that mix, we need to be thinking, you know, about you know the Irish context and the challenges. So some of the learnings we've had ourselves, and and from our speakers today, you know, the current the current governance structures that are there, you know, it, they are stronger than they are in the first cycle. But you know, do we need to look at that in terms of strengthening those? What do we know about the pressures and the necessary measures? And I think this is key to be thinking about this uh, because we do have to be real. In terms of you know there are certain measures that just have to be addressed and and have to be underpinned by science in terms of how we resolve them but in terms of how we go about that of course you know uh, and bring society along and and look for that local knowledge and that local learning you know is really important when we do our public meetings by the way we do look for that we do look for that input we do look for those uh, that local context to help us understand and, and, and i suppose identify areas that we might have thought of and also to try and influence and um, who are the, the key pressure owners if that's the right word um, what do we know about the capacities of community groups and the networks? You know, what can community groups really do? People are time limited. You know, how much resourcing does need to be, need to be put in place and how should that resourcing be done? And can be done in a way that, you know, we have a, a proper network or framework to do that so that it is all coherent. Because at the end of the day, we do need the actions and outputs uh, to try and turn this whole thing around and protect uh, what we have. Um, what do we know about what interests people? You know, we've got the proliferation at the moment of greenways and blueways, people, you know, uh, getting more closer to nature. COVID-19 has been, a, a, I suppose, a, an eye-opener for a lot of people, bringing people out. So this is an area that we'll see more interest in. We're seeing it ourselves in terms of nature-based solutions, in terms of stuff we'll do with local authorities, for example, on service water management. So this is a, this is a, a potentially a positive area. So, um, and then finally, what level and role... Um, you know, for all of this, do we need to consider in terms of, you know, you know, the multiple levels, but, you know, we have the national level, the actual plan itself. You know, we have now this idea of the 46 catchments uh, plans. How are they going to look? You know, what will they, um, uh, how can they be rolled out? And then, of course, at the local level, um, and specifically these areas for action where we actually have, um, you know, uh, a process in place to try and address those areas for action and, you know, the community um, participation there, you know, I would say this, that, you know, we do find, you know, there is huge interest, but at the same time, we also do find sometimes that, you know, the interest just may, may not be there, whether that is to do with uh, local knowledge or people are busy or whatever. So there is a huge resource um, consideration in, in, in all of this. So, you know, whatever process we do uh, develop into the third cycle, um, it will have to be, um, um, you know, resourced. And, and focus. So that is the really the challenge is to try and put all this in. So there's a, there's a whole, there's a lot of spinning plates in this to try and get it uh, 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 so that's a workable um, process is the challenge. So I think you know we're starting into the third cycle. I, I'd be quite op optimistic that um, you know the department are talking about multiple benefits, to, uh, multiple approaches. So going back to your film concept, Greta, I think this is this is where where um, we need to be kind of thinking, um, and that is what engages, we're finding, that is what engages people. If it's just water quality, that's a boring conversation for a lot of people. But if you can bring in that broader, you know, um, complexity or complexion, every river, every water body has a personality, and that's the way I look at it, you know. So every, every one of them has are special in some way, and that's important we get that across to, uh, you know, develop that pride and sense of place so we can get the community action and then find a way that we can support all of that. So Greta, I better finish there. So I think I'm just going over. Cheers. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Fran. <laughs>
That, I, I could hardly keep up with you. That was a, a very fast run through there of a lot of information. But it is really good to see the progress that has been made through the second cycle. You know, and there are a number of structures and um, everything is in place. But it is about how we need to be looking forward now to the third cycle and what we need to be putting in place for the third cycle. And it was great to have Michal's uh, contribution there on his recommendations. You know, and it was very clear what's needed in governance, what sort of expertise is needed and the funding uh, that is needed. But I'd like to put that question maybe to all of you is like, um, what are the challenges that communities are facing in delivering real action on the ground? You know, um, so what are what would you recommend that needs to be put in policy? What is the first thing that you think about? You know, Michal has made his contribution, but for the rest of you, maybe uh, you would have a view on this. I'd start maybe with uh, Mark. Yes, thanks, Greta. Um, I'll go back to the point that I made at the end of my presentation that uh, there are groups establishing uh, right across the country, be they associations, rivers trusts, they're taking different forms, but they all have similar objectives. They want to take action locally. Um, and in order to do that, they need the support that enables them to get the bit of insurance that they need to do the projects that they want to do. Uh, they maybe need to purchase some resources to deliver a project. And what we're seeing consistently uh, amongst uh, community associations, rivers trusts, is that um, funders are willing to give money for capital costs, uh, in fact, quite large sums of money to do very strategic and technical projects, uh, but they're not willing to support the costs of the person that would oversee and manage that project. So this seems to be... Um, you know, uh, it, does, it, it doesn't really make sense that you would give a community-led organisation hundreds of thousands of euro to deliver actions on the ground, but not cover the costs of anyone to actually deliver it and oversee it. Uh, and also, uh, these organisations have to carry things like insurance in order to do these jobs. Uh, insurance costs are going up, overhead costs are going up. And none of these things are being covered uh, by the funding that's out there or very or very few funders are willing to actually cover these costs. So whilst there is a huge appetite to form these organisations and the energy and enthusiasm within these groups is it, unquantifiable. I mean, it's, it's staggering when you see what people can do and will do uh, at a local and catchment level. Um, if the funding's not there to support them, they're just not going to be able to survive. And there needs to be a root and branch change in the way that funding is structured, uh, the accessibility to funding, uh, the periods over which funding can be drawn down. Uh, because if we want to see environmental change, we can't expect that to happen in three months or six months. Uh, we need long term uh, approaches to, uh, to funding uh, and accessibility to it. And Michal, I know, has already mentioned the issue around co-finance. Uh, you know, it can be very, very hard to find the small amount of co-finance that's required uh, for a funder and, and that could just blow a project out of the water completely. And it really shouldn't be the, the, the death knell to um, a, a really, really good project that could be delivered otherwise. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, Greg, Sean, Greg. do you have anything to add? Yeah, can I add a positive note though, to it as well? Like I suppose that the Federation of Group Water Schemes are in a kind of unique position. We have ready-made networks on the ground within our catchments itself. Every member of the scheme, you know, that lives in the catchment, that gets the water from the catchment as well, has, has a role to play. And what we found ourselves, like going out, talking to the boards, talking to the managers as well, if we, if we identify a problematic area, if we speak to the farmer, listen to the farmer and put a plan in place, then the group water scheme can come along and they can compensate the farmer for his loss of land or loss of time or put in a put in a fence or put in a riparian zone. Um, similarly as well, like if we identify issues like slurry spreading, which we did in Roscommon, we're able to go out and compensate slurry contractors to come along, attend a training course, listen to their problems, listen to their needs. So, you know, we are in a unique position there to, to kind of help within the catchments themselves. But I suppose it's about listening to people as well, getting people on board and using whatever resources we can. So like not everything is... I suppose negative, like, you know, we, I suppose we understand the other groups as well, like, you know, it might not be in the same position as ourselves, but from our, from our own perspective as well, we are in a very positive place at the moment. 
Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have a lot to learn from the approaches of the group water schemes. And Fran, do you have anything to add? I have a lot of questions here in the chat box I want to get to. So very quickly, if you have anything you'd like to add. Well, I hope what I presented is, I suppose, it's just giving you a, a, a sense of, of some of the work that, that, that is, is, is going on. We've, we've tried to be reactive. So some of the issues that, that, that Mark has just raised here in terms of, you know, we've, we've tried to address some of that. The leader one would be a case in point. But well, it is a recurring challenge that we do find is that, you know, there is that problem around the, the capacity element, the, the, the basic governance requirements, the cost involved in that, registering groups as charities, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there's a, also a fundamental um, uh, conversation that we need to kind of figure out or, or, or um, as we move into this, the third cycle is, is, is the... I suppose the bringing the science and all the work there and the community participation element more 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 tightly together. You know there is a there's a lot of you know to be fair there is there is a lot of effort going on from a lot of different sectors uh, to try and work on this um, and then to try and bring, make sure that a that 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 is effective and would deliver uh, and and b to try and do that in a way that the public are very much involved um, at the at the. the I think. Level. Sorry, Fran, I think that goes back to what Clodo was saying earlier about bringing the community plans and actions into the deliberative, into the democracy or the democratic process. And it is about how that, how the communities work with the agencies to deliver the outcomes on the ground. Now, I wanted to get to some of the questions here in the chat box, if I may. So um, uh, I'll see, Sean, do you think um, that because the National Federation of Group Water Schemes is well rooted within the communities, that this helps with the engagement in, pro in projects? It definitely does. And I think what, what we've found ourselves when we go out there, trust is a major key as well. Like, you know, I've worked in different organizations as well, but if you go in as a local person or somebody who's, who's embedded in the community, it really helps the farmer come on board. So like there's a number of things involved, like, you know, you have to have the expertise. <coughs> you have to show the farmer the scientific data that's there as well. And listen to the, what, what their needs are as well. You know, they have families to feed as well. You know, they have bills to pay. So you can't just come in and demand everything that you want. But if you go in and you listen to them and the fact that we have managers there on the ground, we have boards that have been involved in the, in the community for 30 years, it, it really, really helps. Yeah, I think you have an in already because they know you and they're familiar with you and that works quite well. I have a question here for me, Hall. Do you think that community groups have the expertise required to implement targeted measures to improve water quality and catchments? In a way, that goes back to... Um some of the conversations with Patrick Bresnan earlier on, there's various definitions of expertise, right? And so, of course, it would go without saying, Greta, that you don't necessarily find in the community groups the kind of water quality or technical expertise that you would get in the catchment scientist team at LawPro or in the EPA. But you get a different kind of expertise, which is what Sean is talking about there, or lay knowledge is one way of putting local networks awareness from whatever activity they might be involved in. People, for example, in the Corrib, many years of experience either boating, kayaking, rowing, or fishing. So that brings a form of expertise. And so to my mind, the challenge, and Fran referred to it there exactly a minute ago, I echo fully what he said, for the next cycle, for these 46 plans, is to take, we call it, the formal science, the hard science, the actual catchment reports, the characterization reports that will be done as the first step. Absolutely, that's quite clear. And then to share that, discuss that at a local level and to socialize that and get feedback on that and then ask people what their measures are. I agree with the issue around the lack of literacy, but at the same time, there's both formal and informal knowledge. Social learning is about bringing those various groups together. That's the way to go. Yes, yes. Oh, no, that's very, very good. Thank you very much. I have further questions, but I'm not quite sure if I've got time to um, ask them. I have one question here. I'll just take this top one. How do you bring farm uh, landowners and farmers on board to plant riparian zones and buffer strips? I think you have to listen to the farmers as well. You know, you have to talk to them. Like what, what we found, I think the second last slide I put up there, is if you go in straight away and talk to a farmer and tell him you want a significant area of his farm, he'll, he'll laugh at you, he'll run at you, you know, he'll, he'll chase you off his farm. But if you go in and develop that trust and show them the scientific data that's there to prove that there's a problem and find a way to compensate him as well, like what we found is our, our group water scheme boards are willing to put their hands in their pockets 
and compensate the farmer for the loss of land that he's there. Because, you know, we all want a healthy environment. But if someone said to us, I want to take 10% of your wages, you kind of balk a little bit at them. So you know, we want to make sure that they're not at, not at a financial loss. So that, that's how we do it. Yes, and that's what they do say with the agri-environmental schemes, and they're happy to put in the measures, but they need to be paid or compensated for their income loss because of, of the change in practice. Yeah, so um, another question. Oh, no, that's a question. I'll go for to somebody else, not Sean. I have, um, I'll go down here. Is there a health and safety risk with community volunteering in Irish rivers? There are numerous videos on Twitter highlighting uh, work, but little life jackets and things like that. So um, is there guidance and information available to community groups to ensure that risk is reduced for volunteers? I think that might be a question for Fran. I think you might have... I, I was trying to dodge the question. Um, <laughs> we do, when we work with communities and we do events, we, um, they are risk assessed, so we encourage people to risk assess. And look, we have a template which, which we give people, but you know, we have to be careful. Like Law Pro is it's a shared service for, lo you know, for local authorities and all the stuff that I've just talked about in terms of our work. So the, the problem in Ireland is that you have this whole public liability, um, it, sorry, you know, the whole insurance side of things, it can get very tricky. So the way we approach it with the citizen science is we do not uh, encourage people to uh, to do their kick sampling, for example, uh, without with, with gear other than wader, wellies. So no waders. Um, and that removes then the, the need to be bringing in life jackets and all that type of stuff, because now you're getting into a whole area. Who's, who's maintained life jacket? Do you know how to use the life jacket? You get caught under a tree. So it's about kind of bringing in the common sense. So that's how we deal with that one. I think that's a kind of a very sensible way to approach it. You just give people guidance around uh, where to go. So we, with the citizen science stuff, we, we, we are producing um, materials this year to, and that will be covered in that in terms of, of, the, of the guidance for that. So, um, but with so other stuff like lake sampling and all that type of stuff, we haven't, we haven't got into that. Um, because okay. you, you know, we would encourage people to go to to go out with people who is uh, who are suitably qualified. So, for example, if you're bringing people out on a boat, that person should be uh, registered with the department that they can actually take people out um, and to have the, the the suitable training and that. So, it's, it's an area that would look be sensible and never go out on your own and always always let people know where you are. Yeah, so, yeah. that's yeah. probably the advantage of having a framework, you know, so that that sort of information can be provided through through that network. I have another question here for Sean that seems to be ranking very, very high. It was, um, oh gosh, now I've lost it. Uh, so it was, how do you, um, you know, if you, how do you, are you sure there's enough landowners participating in the project to achieve, achieve water quality outcomes in the catchment? I suppose you know, we have a framework for developing our source protection plans. So what we have to do is go by that framework as well. So our source protection plans identify the areas that need work doing on. And it basically, it's just a matter of going to each of the each of the farms, each of the fields, to make sure that we can do the work that's specified in our plan. Um, it's a process that we just have to go through step by step. You know, we, we we follow the science that's identified in our source protection plan and engage with the farming community to put the measures in place. So it's it's a step by step process. Yes. So it takes time then as well. It takes time. Uh, it takes resources as well. I have a question here for Mark. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. Have you found some catchments can be more resistant to, en resistant to engagement? And have you any advice in uh, response and engagement, uh, where engagements are difficult to achieve? Well, um, I have to confess there's many more catchments to work in. Uh, I haven't been in all of them, uh, but certainly the ones that uh, we have uh, used, for example, the ripple process in the very open and engaging processes. And uh, they don't just jump into those meetings uh, that I spoke about in the presentation. Uh, I suppose in 10 minutes, I could only give an overview. Uh, but there's a lot of work done around informing the public about their water environment, how they engage with it, um, the benefit that they can derive from a healthy water environment. So uh, it's, it's about bringing the river to life for people. Uh, and we did that in the Ballanderry through music, through poetry, uh, through art projects with local schools and local community groups. And then we got into the discussion around uh, planning action for improving this fantastic resource that we turned everyone's attention back towards. So I think in any catchment, one of the first steps is to, first of all, tell people the story of their river. Um, where does it start? Where does it end? 
where do they sit within that landscape and actually listen to the stories of those people that live in the catchment too. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, all catchments will be different. All communities are different. Uh, but if you have um, a very engaging and non-threatening process where everybody comes along, contributes and knows that what they're contributing is going to be taken seriously, it's going to be listened to, it's going to be used uh, then you build that trust that we've heard other people speak about. And that's when the community starts to work together and open up uh, and you see that cohesion uh, forming across the catchment. Very good. Thank you, Mark. I have a question here. I, I don't know if anybody can answer it or not. It says political will must be built to place water on equal footing with climate to achieve meaningful levels of funding support for these initiatives. Ideally, there should be at least one community water officer in each of the 46 catchments. And as Michal mentioned, there should be an increase in the community water fund projects. And how can this be achieved is the question. I don't know if any of you can answer it. Maybe you can. I, Maybe I need a different... I, I don't know if I can answer, Greta, but I, I would just say I was speaking to Inland Fisheries this morning and they actually made that very point that we need to get water uh, on, on, on the national conversation. The climate is, they felt, is, is hogging the media in terms of it's getting a lot of attention and yet the water you know, side of things is not really getting, it's not getting the same attention even though they are actually related uh, yeah. in a sense. So, so yeah, so, so it, it, it is an important issue how, how, how we get there. And I suppose this goes back to, I would say, look, the River Basin Management Plan consultation is happening right now for the third cycle. Please at least everybody engage in that. And when we do go out on the, uh, we, we are engaging at the municipal district level and that we've designed it that way. So it's more accessible in terms of the elected members because these are the areas they relate to. So it's important that we, you know, we build that into the process. Um, and, and again, we keep saying to people, look, you know, it's important to let our, our, our elected representatives know. And, and I, I do think actually, Greta, on that, the, you know, there's maybe it's an opportunity. We mentioned the PPNs. But also just the special policy committees, and maybe that's an area that we need to focus more on in, in this um, cycle in getting the conversations happening at that level, because that's where the, the, the elected members do engage as well. So it is a challenging piece, but you know, we are a democracy and we have to accept that. And it's, it's about everybody trying to play their part. I think also film tries to address that as well, taking the landscape approach and that's for, uh, and they have mentioned it in the draft river basin management plan that we will be addressing biodiversity, climate and water together. And it is about looking at the landscape picture and the fact that all of these uh, environmental components are interrelated. So they have to be addressed uh, collectively. It's very difficult to separate them out and address them all individually. So that's back to the original conversation about breaking down the silos and everybody working together to find the solutions. And again, it goes back also to um, what I said before about, you know, the whole premise of public participation. It's about engaging communities so that the actions are delivered on the ground. So it's not just communities delivering those actions, but equally the local authority it'll feed into their plans and into the statutory body's work as well. So it, it has to be a collaborative approach. And that's what uh, the film is proposing and recommending. And we would like to have that included in the next uh, River Basin Management Plan cycle. So um, let me see if I have further questions. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the time is. I, I think we might be over time. What? Ten minutes over. So I think it is time to go to the poll. And uh, thank you all for staying on for so long. And I, I am going to pass over to Suzanne, who's going to give um, the, the closing argument or the closing statement. And also, um, I would like to take it at this opportunity to thank you all for your contributions. And I want also to the poll to see what the poll results are. Maybe if we could see that. Uh, before Suzanne finishes. Thank you. Sorry, yes, uh, okay. Um, I'm just having to put my glasses on to see the poll results, um, but it looks like we, we, for the most part, got up to very important in terms of people's people's opinion. Um, how important do you rate effective public participation and action at local level as a means to achieve Ireland's target for good water quality? Um, and very important. So that's that's our, our, our poll result. Um, so 
Thanks, everybody. Um, and that was a great second session um, and a great first session, obviously, beforehand. Um, but before I close uh, this webinar, I'd really just like to go back and address the query or the comment that I didn't get to in the first session um, about what can practically be done in the next 12 months to implement film. So one of the aims of today um, is that the Water Forum will take all of the learnings that, that we got from today and bring them into our submission for the River Basin Management Plan. Um, we'll also continue to engage with the department um, to ensure that this happens. Um, and that's also a reminder to, to everybody here today and to all of you that the consultation process for the River Basin Management Plan is still open and everybody can make a submission to the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage by the 31st of March. Um, and I know we're, we're short on time, but I would really sincerely like to thank all of our speakers today from both sessions for really excellent, um, really informative and well thought out presentations and, and full of, of key learnings and recommendations. And, and I thoroughly enjoyed and, and learned a lot from every single presentation there today. And also to the speakers for taking time out of their very busy schedules, because I know each and every one of you is, is incredibly busy and incredibly active. Um, from the forum's perspective, this is the start for us of a really important conversation around the participatory process. And, and I think that's really come across in today's, in today's sessions. And, and what I think is really important to note is that it's not, it's not just for today. This is an ongoing process that will continue and, and we'll build and build on this. Um, and then finally, a reminder to everybody, I suppose from a housekeeping perspective, that all of the, all of the, uh, all of the presentations were recorded today. They'll all be made available on the Water Forum's website so keep an eye there and as far as I'm aware there will be a link sent out to all of the participants as well and then finally I suppose finally finally um, just to thank you all for attending and, and to thank all of our participants for such active engagement as Greta said again in both sessions there was a huge number of questions huge number of queries um, really great engagement and, and obviously we couldn't get to everything but we will follow up that's one of the things we do promise to do follow up with the speakers and the presenters and, and go back to the audience um, so that's it thank you for staying with us thank you for your engagement and until the next one everybody goodbye thank you